Okay, so um, uh, you just we'll, we'll get past this in just a second here. Just think with Tom Cryer, for those who are uh, expressing interest in that, uh, Tom Cryer, uh, the issue was about uh, a fellow by the name of Clifford Kidd who was facing a tax case, federal tax case, in Austin, Texas. And I went there and uh, Clifford was convinced by a female to file some 1099 uh, documents with IRS stuff against the judge. And I knew that it was going to be a problem, but he was convinced that, you know, that she was on the right track and he filed that stuff and immediately they wanted to uh, withdraw his bond and put him in jail so that he would spend the time in jail the whole time pre-trial and uh, they set a hearing for that and I went I mean I was there with Clifford see and Tom Cryer was not and Tom Cryer thinks that I created that problem when I did not, because I don't do that stuff. You know, I know what it is. If this guy goes ahead and files that stuff against the judge, the judge is gonna crack the whip on him. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, <clears throat> Tom Cryer had even put it, if I recall correctly, in two documents. And, you know, one was mine, but the other one was not. And my document was simply my entry into the case so that I could help Tom Cryer, not Tom Cryer, help uh, Clifford Kidd. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, my contention on that whole deal is that I did help Clifford Kidd because he didn't go to jail at that time. You know, I told him that all he had to do was say to the judge, I made a mistake, I'm sorry I filed that stuff and I withdraw it from the record and it would be gone. And sure enough, that's what happened in the, in the end at that hearing. But the judge was uh, still upset and wanted him to have an attorney. You know, like I say, the problem documents were not, I didn't create them and had nothing to do with them. All I told him is that if you just withdraw those documents, you won't go to jail. And sure enough, when he withdrew that document, those, those IRS documents, he did not go to jail. But the judge told him in standard operating procedure, told him that he needed an attorney. So he went back to Cryer. And the bottom line on that is, Clifford Kidd was convicted. Okay, now, <clears throat> which Cryer lays out is a success. <laughs> kind of funny to me. I think that success is when you're not convicted. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> he, he says that it was house arrest, but you know, you know, whatever kind of arrest you're under, uh, it's not only that, but the conviction is a problem for anybody to get a felony conviction. You know, I, does it, is there anyone here who doesn't understand what I'm talking about? When you, when you get a felony conviction, you've got a big problem. Uh, <clears throat> I know one woman that is like an angel, and she managed to get herself a conviction they, they said that they were going to drop it down to a misdemeanor, but they left it on the record somehow it was a felony. And she got herself a good job with the Target Distribution Center. And she started work there already, and then they said, no, you got a felony on your record, you're out of here. So she lost her job in a flash, just because of what was on her record, even though the woman herself is like an angel and wasn't guilty of the thing in the first place. <clears throat> but it's easy enough to get tagged with a felony and the cops have these computers in their cruiser cars and they get behind you at a red light and 
just for fun, they run the plate and they see who you are. And then once they see that you got a felony on your record, then they'll shake you down and you know, they want to see if you got drugs or you're drinking or you this or you that. You know, it's the guys who got felonies on their records go through constant harassment with the police. It's just the way it is. <clears throat> so anyway, that's Cryer, and that's enough of that nonsense. Um, one of the things I was going to share with you, trying to get off of this thing, but uh, Barefoot Sanders in that case with the State Department, and by the way, that case number is, for those who wanted to look it up, uh, the case number for the case itself remains, that case remains in the law books. The, code, the citation in the United States code annotated, that's gone because Congress changed the law. But the case itself is U.S. versus Fox, 766 F SUP 569. Say that again. 766 F SUP. 569. Now, we're, we're at a, now that I mentioned that, I'm going to share something else with you all. Does everyone here know how to use the law library? No. Okay. Would you like to know in just like two, three minutes flat? Yes. Okay. <laughs> It is, it is so simple and so logical, it's just incredible. You go to the front door. <laughs> okay, my case is this citation, okay? 766 F sub 569. Now, this is, a, this is like a code, okay? And this number here, is the volume of the book. This is, how should we say, the category, and this is the page. So you go into the law library and you say, where's the F's up? You say, well, it's over there. And so you go to this gigantic rack of books and you look for book number 766 and it's right on the spine, 766. And these numbers go up to 999, and then they start over, okay? Then you go to soup line. So, so 766 in the F sub rack, and you get this book in your hands, you open it to page 569, and there it is. Now, now I have other stuff like, uh, oh, okay, well, I should give you a thought of a real good one. Now this one says U.S. and this means United States Supreme Court, okay? If you go to this book, number 407, U.S., and look at page 25, you're going to see a case called Arthur Singer versus Hamlin, and so on and so forth. Very now, important case. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Heitman knows that's an important case. Uh, and you can win, regardless of your circumstances in, in the court system, you can win with this one if you know what you're doing. <coughs> I mentioned to you at the beginning that the good news is you can win on all these categories, and one of them I said is on the council issue alone. Didn't I say that? Okay. Well, a winning on the council issue alone. This this site is a case called Arthur Sanger versus Hamlin, 407 U.S. 25. Okay. Arthur what? Arthur Sanger, A R G E R S I N G E R H A versus Hamlin, H A M L I N. I think it is. I will provide you the site on that stuff too. Okay. And so, what that case says is no accused, that's y'all, no accused may be deprived of his liberty as the result of any 
criminal prosecution, whether felony or misdemeanor, in which he was denied assistance of counsel. And people will say, well, they brought me into court and right away they wanted to give me an attorney. <laughs> right? Well, what you need to do is, is thank him, but you need to interview the attorney for competence. Now, when you interview the attorney for competence, you're going to find that he's not competent. So it goes like this. When they bring you in and the judge says, well, I'm going to assign you this attorney here, blah, blah. Oh, thank you, thank you, judge. Thank you so much. I was really worried. And, but you, you're helping me here, and I really appreciate it. However, I do need to interview this attorney to make sure he's competent. Now, on this topic, let's say this. I have a friend in Los Angeles named Ron, and he's currently facing a tax issue, and the court has signed him a, an attorney. And so Ron questioned his attorney as to his success, which is, you know, of course, one of the questions you want to know. <laughs> and the attorney's response was that 20 years ago, he helped one guy get a lesser sentence. <laughs> now, doesn't that really excite you if you're facing a serious prison time? 20 years ago, you have one guy get a lesser sentence. I mean, is that a whiz bag or what? <laughs> so, so if, if you ask, and I've got a set of questions, like 200 questions, and you know, uh, those of you who have emails and the rest of that, you know, I can get that to you pretty quick and easy. Uh, and we need to start probably make notes of this stuff pass, too. Pass around the list for email? Well, you know what? Uh, we, can, we can do this. Uh, is Susie Howell? I think Susie Howell. Susie's got it. Okay. Because if I have, if I have your name, your phone number, your email, and your snail mail U.S. postal designation, I can keep in contact with you and send you stuff. That'd be great. Okay? Yeah, we need that. That'd All right. Great. We're on the same team. Is that agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I want to help you all as much as I can. I've got several sets of questions, but one is like 200 questions long. Uh, the bottom line is there's no attorney's going to pass muster on this stuff. So you come back in the courtroom and you say, Judge, I really thank you for having your kind consideration. However, this guy's incompetent. And the judge is going to say, well, uh, we've got this other guy here. He, he's real good. He's, he, he's, you know, real good. And you say, well, uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, you know, I need to interview him first because my life is at stake here. He says, okay, well, go use the jury room there and, and interview him. So you go off there and you interview the guy. And he's, he's as goofy and as competent as the other one. You know, they're all attorneys. And so, so then you come back and you say, well, Judge, you know, I really appreciate your kind consideration, but, but, but this guy's incompetent. Well, it's possible it could go to three attorneys, but I have never seen that happen. Okay, typically at the end of two, it's finished. And by that I mean the the uh, the judge is going to flip right out, and he's going to say, "There's no attorney in the whole state that's going to satisfy you, so you're just going to have to represent yourself," and that's that. <laughs> okay? Now, when he does that, what happened? They lost the case. Do you think so, judges know about this? Okay. They know, but they think that you don't, so keep your mouth shut about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't talk too loud here. Well, you know. I, I get amazed that, 
the, how stupid these guys can get because I can show you this. I got this right here. This, you can't see it, of course. It's just printing here. But somebody might want to look at it. And what this is is the Ferguson case. Two pages, the first two pages. And I notified the judge in Tim and Dawn's case about this thing here. And when he went off on me, when I raised the issue of religious objection to the oath, I mean, I couldn't believe that the guy was so stupid, you know? But then this is a judge who right behind him has got a portrait of himself in the courtroom, a portrait of himself, four feet tall and two and a half feet wide. The only people I know of that's got these gigantic portraits behind them are people who are really, really convinced that they are something out of this world. Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, Saddam Hussein, you know. <laughs> you, you get the picture. So, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I could be so dumb as to not know. I, I mean, the, this is from the Fifth Circuit. This is his bosses. He didn't read their thing. He didn't read my stuff in the civil case that I warned him about this. And the whole thing's blowing up in his face because he denied me, uh, you know, my right to testify and Tim's right to have me as a witness. The guy's an idiot. Well, uh, and, and especially the fact that they don't understand that religious, what religious freedom means. See, I mentioned it to you right at the beginning that there are you know, some powerful tools and religious freedom is wonderful, you know, and I've got a list here that I just threw together in the jail cell, okay? Now, uh, you know, one of the things was, I went to Dallas County Jail, and uh, they served breakfast, and I didn't touch the tray, and the guard came to, they come to pick up the empty trays, and he sees that I haven't touched the food, he says, what's the problem? And then I said, well, I don't eat pork because it's against you know, against the, the, the Levitical food laws. And he said, well, that's not pork. I said, well, what is it? He said, that's ground turkey. I said, are you sure? He said, absolutely. He said, the Muslims have sued us so much that there is no pork in the kitchen whatsoever. None. <laughs> ah, only pigs. And, and, only pigs. Huh? Only pigs. Only pigs. <laughs> So, uh, and in uh, uh, this one guy, Jeff Skiba, uh, you know, I'd already had this experience on the oath issue in the Skiba case. I'll come back to that. But because we're talking about the religious freedom, I'm just going to give you this other, a couple other points here. And one of the real whoppers is this one here, Gonzalez v. O Centro Espirita Beneficient Unia do Vegetal. And uh, anyway, what this is, this is a case. U.S. Customs had some five barrels, and I guess these are like 55 gallon drums, on the dock. Uh, I think it was probably Los Angeles or something. These barrels had come barrels of tea from Brazil destined for a Brazilian Indian tribe church in Arizona. <laughs> so maybe you all have heard of it. So one of these customs officials takes it upon himself to check what this tea is. And you know, it's like the powder stuff, you know, like you got in a tea bag or something. But this is no ordinary tea. They check and they find it's Schedule 1. Now, do you know what Schedule 1 is? Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, those are Schedule 1, okay? So, five barrels of this stuff, and they go bonkers because they check 
and they find out that there's been 15 previous shipments. <laughs> you know? And so that brings the Department of Justice uh, attack on this church in Arizona, and the whole works goes all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court said to the Department of Justice, there was a time when something could be done about this. However, now that Congress has passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, you could forget it. Give them their tea back. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a happy church. That's <laughs> <laughs> a happy church. <laughs> I heard this last item here, something that's interesting. And I cite this in all of my stuff in this first paragraph on an affidavit. And what it is, is Federal Public Law 97280, 96-1211. You don't need to worry about writing it down because I'm going to provide you with the affidavit and you'll see it in there, in the first paragraph. Now, what that law is, is it something special? And what's special about it is this, that this law is the only law that has ever passed through Congress unanimously. Even the declaration of war against Japan after Pearl Harbor did not pass unanimously. This is the only one that ever did. And what this law says is that the Bible is the word of God and, it, and we should apply its teachings in our lives. It goes on to say a bunch of other stuff, but that's the serious part. It's the only law that ever passed through Congress unanimously. It declares the Bible is the word of God, and we should apply its teachings in our lives. And I use that continually. Why do you think that I'm still here? Immigration would have deported me. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so... You should say the King Huh? You should say the King James Version. Well, I understand that that's, that's commonly accepted. I've got the King James Version right here. But, uh, you know, there are some others that are very good, too. Not the no, no, they all misrepresent the real the truth. Don't, don't argue with him. Yeah. He's better than me. Well, he can, use, he can use the right cover. What's inside doesn't matter, right? <laughs> uh, You've got the right Bible. You know what, what it is is telling you that he tells you the message with with stammering lips, etc. And what it is is that you have to pray for wisdom when you read that book because the stuff is hidden from you. I'll give you a for instance. I, I I don't know how many people here understand that like number one, the Bible doesn't waste words. And it says that David selected five smooth stones from the brook. Now, why was it five instead of three or 15? Why? Goliath had four brothers. They're named elsewhere in the scriptures. So if you think about that one for a second, from David's perspective, like a chess player, from his perspective, he's going up against Goliath. Goliath has four brothers. When he kills Goliath, the four brothers are going to be on him. So how many stones is it going to take with our Heavenly Father guiding his aim? Five. One for Goliath and four for the brothers. <laughs> not six. Not seven. No misses. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right, but that's all you could count. Uh, that's all he could count. He forgot about his other hand. <laughs> Okay, so, um, all right, this thing here, by the way, you know, all of these different categories, uh, they'll be like, uh, uh, they'll be, this one here, there's, there's, there's F, F2D, F3D. If you can imagine this, you go to this law library, 
And this stands for, this F sub stands for the federal trial court. Their appellate court is just F, okay? But this is the first series. Then it goes to the second series, F2D. Then it goes to the third series, F3D. Like I mentioned, the spine of the book goes from, from one to 999. It's basically a thousand books in each set. So in this stuff, you're looking at, you know, what you're working on your third thousand. And so there's a lot of stuff there. But uh, uh, this, this kind of an arrangement where this is the volume, this is the, the set of books, and this is the page number, you can find anything in a flash in that law, law library. And so you don't need to be scared of it at all. How's that for a quick short uh, law library visit? Okay, so um, uh, on the, the council issue again, you know that Arger Singer versus Hamlin. If you get them on that, it's their their toes. They did this. Uh, I'll explain this case to you, um, and this is kind of, kind of interesting. I think anyway. You tell me if you don't think so. Uh, so there's this guy, Don McCarley, this is a true story. So Don McCarley uh, is a trucker and he stops to use the phone at his brother's office, a high rise office tower on the North Dallas Loop, okay? So he's there on the phone and that day, surprise, surprise, nine IRS agents arrive with their badges and guns and it's search and seizure time, folks. And they come up to him and they grab the phone from him and slam it down and they say, who are you? And he says, uh, am I under arrest? And they said, no. He said, well, fabulous. And he goes, I'm out of here. <laughs> and he gets up and he goes out to the hallway and he's going down the hall and suddenly he remembers he forgot his car keys on the desk. He half turns around. They tackle him to the floor, beat him up, handcuff him, and haul him off to jail and charge him with two charges one is assaulting federal officers, and the other one is impairing a search and seizure. Well, he doesn't have the money for an attorney. And I'm not an attorney, but, you know, sometimes I do some typing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happens is, I typed a thing up and it says, uh, these IRS agents that say that they were assaulted, and by the way, this is, you have to get how preposterous this is. Because meek, mild, polite Don McCarley, who is so nice to everybody, unarmed is going to attack nine armed IRS agents. <laughs> you know, like, how ridiculous can you get? It's so preposterous that, you know, any logical person is gonna say, that's ridiculous. But it gets better because they, I, I put in the document, I said, okay, these IRS agents claim that Don McCarley assaulted federal officers and they're the federal officers that he assaulted. Only problem is, IRS agents are not a part of the government, therefore they're not federal officers. And their claim that they are is a 10-year felony. Oh wow. <laughs> oh, wow. And that charge disappeared from the planet. <laughs> there was no discussion. There wasn't a hearing. There was no talking about it. There was no paperwork. There was no response. That charge was disappeared from the planet, and that was the end of that charge. Gone. <laughs> now. Don McCarley comes into court, and federal judge Jerry Buckmeyer is there, and Jerry Buckmeyer knows me because he's the guy who signed the order to send me to Springfield on the oath issue, and while I was at Springfield getting my head examined, 
While I was there getting my head examined about the oath issue, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, his bosses, ruled in my favor in the Betty Ann Ferguson days. <laughs> you know, and anyway, Jerry Buckmeyer's there. Don McCarley, he, he, he informs Jerry Buckmeyer that he wants Robert Fox as his assistant to counsel. And Jerry Buckmeyer says, no, no, no. Mr. Fox is not a licensed attorney in the state of Texas. And the answer to that is no, and no is no, and that's it. There's no way. Okay? So what did he do? He denied Don McCarley assistance of counsel. And he wanted to force him to go to trial on his own two feet. And that's what happened. Don McCarley went to trial on his own two feet, doing the best he could. And he didn't have assistance of counsel. Jerry Buckmeyer denied that. And so these IRS agents, they said that Don McCarley beat them up. They didn't claim to be federal officers anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> they just said that Don McCarley beat them up and, and damaged their wristwatch and bent their eyeglasses. Oh, it was just terrible. <laughs> and uh, uh, so they, they went on to say, that the way he impaired the search and seizure, which was another puzzling thing, because how does Don McCarley impair the search and seizure when he's in the hallway and the search and seizure's in the office? <laughs> well, you're gonna love this one. So they talked about it, and it was the prosecutor that really helped the jury to understand how Don McCarley impaired the search and seizure. Now, the way, this, the way the trial goes, by the way, for those who don't know the newbies, the government goes first, they present their witnesses and evidence. You got the prima facie break, then the defense presents their witnesses and evidence. Then it goes to closing arguments. The government goes first, then the defendant goes next, and the government gets another shot at it with no possibility of rebuttal from the defense. Okay? It's a setup, you know? So that the government gets the last word. They get the first word, they get the last word. That's why their win ratio nationwide is less than 2% for our side. You know, when the cops say, you did something, you're almost a goner right there, unless you study alternative stuff like this. You know, and what I'm describing to you in this a council issue is one that you could potentially win with even if you were guilty 10 times over. So, so they said, the prosecutor says, well, the way he impaired the search and seizure was that it took three officers to take him to jail and they came with nine and they only had six left to do the work. Wow. Now, I, I wrote up the, the thing for his, his allocution and pointed out that following that logic, they could have stopped at the Galleria Mall, selected three random shoppers, put three officers on each one, taken them to jail, and boy, the search and seizure would have been really impaired because there would have been nobody to do it. <laughs> you can't tell us what happened after you put the handcuffs on him, you got to tell us what happened before you put the handcuffs on him. Right? Right. And was he impairing the search and seizure before the handcuffs? <laughs> no, he was in the hallway. So anyway, Don McCarley comes in for sentencing because they, the jury convicted him. They listened to this crap and, and went ahead and convicted the poor guy. And so, you know, I mean, he was devastated. And I said, well, it's not over yet. Because you got sentencing. And at sentencing, the judge has to ask a question. And the answer, if you know what to, to give the right answer, you walk out the front door. I'm, I, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. The, there's a, 
Uh, do you remember Robert Bork? Yeah. 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 Okay. He was Solicitor General for the United States. If somebody sued the United States, that lawsuit landed on his desk. So he was Solicitor General for the United States. They were considering him for Supreme Court justice. He didn't make it, but he wrote a book called The Tempting of America in the first edition, first edition, because after that it's deleted, he made the statement that everyone who is in prison in America today is there voluntarily. Voluntarily. And the place where you volunteer in their criminal process is at sentencing. And the rule on that is the Federal Rule 32, which is uh, to do with sentencing, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in that rule, but there's a paragraph in there that says the court shall, and shall means must, the court shall address the defendant personally. You may have an attorney, you may have like the dream team like uh, OJ, but that doesn't count. The court address, the judge addresses the defendant personally, eyeball to eyeball with the defendant, and is required, the court is required by the rule to inquire whether the defendant has a statement to make or any information in mitigation of sentence. Well, now, isn't that interesting? Let me ask you. Since they've already got the jury conviction or bench trial judge conviction, they've got the cells waiting, they've got the, all the guns, they've got immense manpower, and they have to ask a question. <laughs> the reason they have to ask a question is because it's your turn to volunteer. So, if you give them the wrong answer, you go to prison. And in Don McCarley's case, we've done it up in writing with an allocution affidavit. And that is helpful, but it's not the be all and end all. The real, the real stuff, the, the real deal is what you speak in the courtroom. Like I mentioned, affidavits are hearsay until they're testified to. So, so when Don McCarley speaks it, that's what really does it as testimony. So, Don McCarley's allocution, the number one issue was, the number one was the fact that he'd been denied assistance of counsel, he requested me, was denied, and the, the United States Supreme Court said that they can't put him they can't incarcerate him on that basis. How do you like that? Then the other parts went on, like how do, how do they possibly claim that Don McCarley assaulted, or, or pardon me, impaired the search and seizure, because the assault thing was gone. Uh, the, how he impaired the search and seizure on the basis of them talking about what happened after they put the handcuffs on. And, there was a whole bunch more stuff in there, and uh, you know that the judge isn't an Article Three judge, and, and uh, that the court isn't right, and so on and so forth. And um, so anyway, the Arthur Sanger versus Hamlin and the other stuff carried the day, and Don McCarley walked right out the front door of the federal courthouse in Dallas. At his sentencing. Now, before that happened, of course, he's in court, and you'll get a kick out of this, I think. Um, knowing what they're like, uh, I, I did up a script for Dawn just in case, in case the, the assistant U.S. attorney uh, tried to speak at his allocution. And sure enough, that's what happened. Don McCarley started up, and immediately the assistant U.S. attorney jumps up to object. So 
So Don McCarley turns on him and says, this is my elocution and I deny that any petty farmer shakes or groveling for filthy lucre has the status standing and authority to speak at my elocution. And that guy went beat red, sat down, had not another word to say, there wasn't a peep out of the federal judge. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I need to hear it. <laughs> You're putting me on. Okay, you want to hear it again? Serious? Yeah. Okay, Don McCarley said to him, when he jumped up to make an objection, Don McCarley said, This is my elocution. And I deny that any petty fogger shyster groveling for filthy lucre has the status, standing, and authority to speak at my allocution. The allocution is the judge asks him a question and he makes the answer. The prosecution's got no space in there. You get it? No space. They've got no room to talk. The objection. It's between him and the judge. Can you just say shut up? That sounds good. That sounds good. It's not as good as what I put together. <laughs> you need to have a mouth full of words on that one. Yeah. Juicy. <laughs> so, goes to show you can still have some fun. And, uh, but they didn't think it was fun for, for the systemites. And, and Jerry Buckmeyer actually tried hard to get Don McCarley just to shut up and go away, <laughs> you know. But uh, Don McCarley had to get the stuff off his chest because he was really upset about the whole situation. And so he laid it on him thick and heavy and walked out the front door. And what did they do? They just let him walk out? And yeah. Him. That's it? After he speaks, he says, you're freely out? The judge let him go. He didn't volunteer didn't volunteer exactly and so if you're ever faced with that situation and we'll go over it uh, tomorrow we'll go over it, you know the steps in the process you get to that position do not volunteer or consent to any of it you know because they're going to say well uh, we want to you know sentence you to such and such so, well, excuse me, what's the sentence for someone who's innocent? Well, you're not innocent, you were found guilty. No, you, you guys framed me with your nonsense. You denied me my witness, you know, like like Tim and Don. You know, uh, they, the, the judge denied me when they asked me to be their witness. I was flanked by five U.S. Marshals and basically booted out. Okay? That's against the law. You know, how this judge ever thought he could get away with that nonsense is beyond me, but, you know, he's an idiot. You know, he's so infatuated with his big portrait behind him. <laughs> you know. He's watching himself. Yeah, he's so busy with watching himself that, you know, that he doesn't have time to read my documents. Otherwise, he would have known that he was being forewarned as to the possibilities. They, they do break the law and they get away with it. And the reason they get away with it is because we don't know what to do. Am I correct? Yep. Yep. And, and this gentleman brought up about, he said, we don't know what to do. And, and he said that uh, earlier uh, that um, in private, that, he, that he'd done some affidavits and, and that nothing happened. And um, of course, I don't know exactly how or why in your particular case uh, affidavits work for me and if they don't work for people um, I'm not exactly sure why but um, you can run into bozo idiots like this judge in Tim and Don's case or Jerry Buckmeyer who just openly told uh, uh, Don McCarley that he couldn't have me as assistance of counsel. You know, and of course, since then, you know, I mean, 
I've sat at the defense table in five different states and federal court. In Texas, by the way, the judge had three of us, not just me, but uh, Richard Taylor and uh, um, another guy, another guy but I, the name's on the tip of my tongue, it'll come to me, but because uh, he's a real good guy too. So there were three of us at the defense table helping uh, Kenny O'Kane. And unfortunately, Kenny had left the whole thing to the last minute and I working around the clock. And he was so exhausted, he couldn't function. I prepared a set of questions for him. He couldn't even read them. Yes. Okay. Yes. With that statement. You're right. I can tell you why that is. Pardon me? I can tell you why that is. Okay. You want? There are you want? Right. Microphones. Yeah, but keep it short. <laughs> I was at a hearing, and I had three witnesses sitting back here. Take your hand off the mic. Three witnesses sit back here. They were going to testify to the affidavits they put in. This judge says to me, I would have known better, but I didn't. I thought I'd cite it. So I figured I was going to win this case no matter what. Well, he says, this is going to take a long time. He says, why don't we just agree? And I'm sure Mr. Erickson, the other attorney, will agree that we'll just put them on the record and they will be as if they were testified to you know, ready to and it's going to save us a whole lot of time, but we'll be here most of the day if we don't do things. And he says, so, won't you agree, Mr. Erickson? Yeah, I said, I agree. I guess he would. And as soon as I said, yeah, I tried. You know why? Because so it would testify One of those te testimonies, one of those affidavits had, you have 30 days or so many days in which to answer or deny this. And if they didn't do that, then they must testify to the affidavit or the affidavit's worthless. And I walked out of there. This same judge took the files to his office 130 miles away to Pocatello, Idaho, and kept them six weeks. And a lot of the stuff that was on the record is not there anymore. So what I'm telling you is the affidavit has to be tested unless it has the language in it that he put in there. Otherwise, you're fried. There was one other thing that you mentioned there uh, just a minute ago. I forgot what it is. That, that seemed, that's the most important thing I had to say about it. There was some, something else that was in my mind. I can't remember what it was because I'm over age. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the affidavits that I'm doing, like he was saying, you know, it's taken some time to put that stuff together, and I haven't had anybody challenge me on that stuff. And, you know, to me it means that it's working. You know, if, you, if you're going to use something, you're welcome to copy it. You know, you have your own case, and the particularities of your own case, but the the framework of the affidavit with this paragraph and the way it ends, those two pieces are, to my way of thinking, they're a proven element from this. But if you deviate outside that, it's at your own peril. You know? I mean, I've had people that, that would delete that whole last paragraph. Now, I don't think that's a smart thing to do because you could easily fall into a trap with them and they could say you made you made a falsification here and they put you in prison. The other thing I had in my mind was this business of allocution. There's a case, I can't remember the name of the case, but I think you can find it if you search it right. It was a Florida case. And this whole black woman had a son that used to deal in and junk. And then he walked home and they, uh, they, they uh, searched the house and they found the uh, 
on narcotics. And they charged her with it. And she didn't know what she was going to do because she wasn't ever involved in the narcotics. You know what to do? Was a kid, but she didn't know what to do. So it came up to allocution. I read this case myself. I forgot the name. I read this case. And it's a Florida case. And she went to sleep there, went to bed that night. And she all of a sudden woke up in the middle of the night and she had this dream. I'm not going to take that sentence. So she goes to court the next day and they go through a whole business. Well, Mrs. Smith, whatever it means, I'm going to give you 25 years in prison. Do you understand me? She says, no, I don't understand. I'm not taking that sentence. Oh, we got to have a sidebar so they can walk up here and have a little talk. And they come back and the attorney walks over. Would you take 12 years? <laughs> and she says, no, I'm not taking that sentence. I am not taking this. I'm not going to jail for something I didn't do. I am not accepting that sentence. When you say you're not accepting that sentence, they've got to pound you in the head of the club until you do accept it. And she kept that up. And they went down the woods and go for six months. And towards the end. And she says, I am not accepting no prison sentence, but I am not a criminal. I am not taking that sentence. Guess what? She walked out the front door. And I, I don't know why I can't remember, but I've got a lot of other things on my mind, too. So uh, that verifies what he said. I remember that case very, very well because I used it myself, the same thing, in a case last uh, uh, January. They found a decision. And it was a, just a, a railroad job. The attorney and the judge and myself, and the attorney testified. The attorney cannot testify for summary judgment, period, because it has to be a live client. And I said, I'm not taking that sentence. I object. And I've done so within three days on the Magnus and Lost Fair Trade Warranty Act. It's a contract they're offering you, and all you have to do is accept the contract. Or not. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> that's that's or not. the key point, is you do not accept anything that they have, and that's the end of it. And the whole system is voluntary, and it's not because I say so. I mean, Robert Bork even put it in his book. And uh, um, on the council issue, I thought of another one I should probably share with you. So I mentioned earlier, some buzzing here. Rewind the tape. Yes, we rewind the tape. Oh. Okay. So, so um, I mentioned earlier John McGladdery. He had a friend, a lady by the name of Isabella Suarez, and uh, she, uh, uh, her husband had been in a train wreck and damaged his head. So he was just good for like sweeping the floor in the warehouse, and um, they had a they had a son, and Isabella was the breadwinner for the family, and she got accused of uh, a felony in Chicago, and they had her in the news and the front page of the newspaper and all. She did like everyone does. Uh, she went ahead and hired herself a good attorney. And um, she took a whole box of evidence that proved that she was innocent. And this guy didn't look at any of it. And he postponed a case it's called continuances. One continuance after another for a year. Getting close to trial, she took him a list of the witnesses to be subpoenaed because these witnesses could prove that she's innocent. He subpoenaed none of them. So just days before the trial, he tells her that she needs to wrap up her stuff because come Monday she's going to trial and she's going to prison. Oh, isn't that a great defense strategy? <laughs> after he, after she paid him, you know, thousands of dollars. 
That's your, that's the defense strategy. I just had a quick question. Um, uh, concerning the allocation, if there's, say, you know, the most perfect scenario where there was eyewitnesses to someone that murdered another person, would that allocution strategy still work? I mean, is it 100% completely um, voluntary? If there's well, it's, no, pardon no. me? Than it's ever in our hands. 
And you can have crooked judges and the guy could bribe the judge and all of that. But when he when he gets out from that, there's no telling what's gonna happen to him. You know, he's gonna meet up with half a dozen muggers in the back alley that are gonna leave him looking like hamburger. Yeah, I've even been told that uh, it's even a volunteer to take your fingerprints. You don't have to give them your hand. Same thing with the TSA. Do you go through the, the, the do you volunteer to be searched? Well, I know that they don't have the authority for a lot of this stuff. And with with regards to the fingerprints, I completely agree. And and I posed the question to, at the Dallas County Sheriff's Department. I said, uh, what statute is it that you rely on for summary brutality in lieu of normal fines and imprisonment? Choke and puke question. You think about it. What statute is it that you rely upon for summary brutality in lieu of the normal fines and imprisonment? When I say I'm not going to give my fingerprints at the Dallas County Jail, instantaneously you got half a dozen guys on you. They will slam you to the floor, and a guy as big as a double refrigerator puts his knee on my neck. My face is mashed into the concrete. I'm passing out, black clouds going through my head. I got my arms twisted up behind my back, all of that, okay? And that came when they tried to, they did something like this to me, when they tried to get me for unauthorized practice of law. And amazingly enough, uh, they basically tortured me and everything else. Now, here comes the funny part. Comes time with all, you know, that you get out, okay? And this deal was only three days long, but it was bad. So on the third day, I'm getting out. And this guy is standing beside me, a black fellow, a young guy, he says, um, I said, this is really funny. He says, uh, uh, you know, you being here. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we were together when you booked in. And he said, this is the first time I've ever booked out with the same guy I booked in. <laughs> and I said, oh, so you saw what they did to me. And he said, yeah, I sure did. And I said, would you be willing to execute an affidavit, sign an affidavit to that effect. And he said, no problem. <laughs> and and they were like in a state of shock when they, when they, they brought me back into, uh, well, not brought me back, but they, that, that just put the kibosh on their whole deal when they started filing an affidavit raising the issue of torture. Okay? And, uh, um, and there was another funny too, if you want to hear it. The the uh, the guy who was representing the committee on unauthorized practice of law, uh, he had uh, brought this process against me, and they arrested me at the post office, and put me in the Dallas County Jail and brought me in the next morning to court. And this attorney goes to the witness stand and testifies. And he says, um, I mailed this stuff to, to Mr. Fox, certified mail. And uh, I have the envelope here. It was a you know, 9 by 12 Mendel envelope. And he says, this came back, and, and uh, I have it here, you know, intact, and, and uh, you know, uh, that uh, I hadn't shown up at the court proceeding. And so uh, the judge says, well, let me see that. So the attorney hands it up to the judge. The judge looks at this one, the law envelope looks at both sides, it's still sealed pulls out his letter opener, scissors, I forget which. Anyway, he opens the end and pulls the document out. 
and he reads the document page by page, and then he says to the attorney, I don't see anywhere in here where you mention the date and time of the hearing. And the attorney says, uh, well, um, I sent that uh, a separate uh, a first class mail. <laughs> and the next question was, hey, do you have any proof of service? And there was this stone silence for a moment or two. And then he says, and it went like a resounding thing through the courtroom. No. <laughs> and their old case collapses. <laughs> judge sits with a sword of binoculars hanging over his head with a fine silver thread and he doesn't want to cut that thread. That's a fact. If you look at the trial of, uh, of uh, the football player, O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson sat in jail for a long, long time and there's a uh, Shakespearean play called King Henry V. It's very short, but there's a soliloquy in that. It's tremendously long. And one man at the time had to memorize this and say it. And uh, it was quite a feat to do that. And in the middle of that, he says, the uh, troops came into the town and they uh, apparently butchered the, the beat the town up pretty bad, so I would say it right now. He said, they may, they may uh, defile virgins, and they may, uh, 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 can't think of the exact quotation, but in the end of it, it says, they, uh, they do all of these things, you know, and he lists them. He says, but they have no wings to fly from God. And that was in 1600, okay? 1624, Shakespeare now. I've got a thing here that you might want to share with these people. I gave it to uh, Susan that I carry around with me just in case I get hit. And it says Federal Court Defense for Tax Cases. This is for. Uh, you want to read it? To I'm not going to go for it. Well, how long is it? Just one or two lines. Of federal tax defense? Yeah. Yeah, it's more uh, willful failure to file. And what it's, I'll read it with it. It says, Your Honor, I'm not aware of any statute that makes me liable for the tax. Not the tax place. That places a duty on me. I can't read what well, I'm going blind when I talk. I see two words at the same time. Uh, and that uh, requires me to file a 1040 form, in individual form, or any other income tax return. What this does for you is two things. It asks the prosecutor, he has to ask the prosecutor to inform the jury. And the prosecutor can't do that because it's a general statement and it doesn't make you or you or me or anybody else in here liable. And they're charging you, not the world. So generally they dismiss the case. But if nothing less, it it maintains your your innocence of and presumption of guilt. And if nothing else is anybody wants to have a copy, we can have it. Thank you. So, um, uh, yeah, I had started to explain this thing with Isabella Suarez and uh, that situation there uh, when, when
she was facing trial and the attorney wasn't doing anything for her, told her to wrap up her affairs because she was going to prison on Monday. She was just going bonkers. And she told John McLattery what the situation was. And he said, you need to get Robert Fox here immediately. So she you know, covered the airfare at home. Let me come to Chicago. And um, I arrived Saturday night. And trial was going to start on Monday. I left basically one day, Sunday, to get ready. And so I explained first off to Isabella Suarez that that um, she could still do okay, and that she was not going to go to trial on Monday if she could keep it straight on just one liner. I said, all you have to do is keep straight in one line, and you will not go to prison on Monday. And so she, that got her attention. <laughs> and uh, I said, first off, what we've we got to do is get rid of the attorney. And I said, I've got the paperwork for that, okay, blah, blah. And, uh, and then I said, the judge, is going to be put in a position where they're going to have a real problem and he's going to try and make you move forward pro se and he's going to say stuff like you're going to have to represent yourself pro se so you hear any of those <coughs> words whether it's pro se or represent yourself so you hear any of that you have to your response is I'm not here pro se, I'm not representing myself, I am myself. And the trick to that deal is this, if you got a coupon for a cup of coffee, can you drink the coupon? No. No. It represents a cup of coffee. If you eat the menu, your tummy will not be satisfied, it's merely the representation. What you want is the real, you know, steak and eggs. Now, so we go there on the Monday morning, and she files, immediately files to terminate the attorney. And it was a heck of an experience, actually, because it was the first time I ever saw anything like this, and I never, ever since. In Chicago, they had, you know how there's two parts, you've got the, the audience area and the action area in that courtroom. And you got the communion rail. That's in most courtrooms. But, there in Chicago, it was bulletproof glass, floor to ceiling. And, you've been there? No? Okay, well, that's what it was. It was bulletproof glass, floor to ceiling, the audience got sound via speakers. The judge had to switch at the altar. If he didn't want you to hear, he just switched it off. And you're watching a silent movie in a glass box. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable, but that's the way it was. And I assured Isabel Suarez that, that I would be with her if I could. I said, but there's no telling uh, what kind of reaction the judge is going to have. So we get up there, and by the way, I've been with a lot of people and had, had success. But in this particular situation, she and I go up there. The judge takes one look at me and he says, are you an attorney? And I said, no. And the bailiff was already coming towards me. And the judge says, well, you get back in the audience area. And he had that kind of tonality that it's like, you're going to be back in the audience area or the bailiff's going to put a few lumps in your head. And, you know, I could tell that there was not going to be any progress in this outfit at that time. But I had already instructed Isabella Suarez in this matter. And I also told her, last one who speaks wins. And I said, this guy's going to try several times. 
So she's up in front of the altar, face to face with the judge. She's having a knee knocking experience. Her whole family's at stake. And the judge says, well, I see that you fired your attorney. And, and we, have, we have a jury pool of 50 jurors here. And, and there's been too many continuances already. And there's not going to be another continuance in that stack. And since you fired your attorney, you're just going to have to represent yourself pro se. And that's it. And she says, no, I'm not here pro se. I'm not representing myself. I am myself. He was like flabbergasted, you know. And he tried again and again and again. And to her credit, she, every time, just like I told her, anytime you hear those words, no, <laughs> you know, I'm not here pro se. I'm not representing myself. I am myself. And this happened like about a half a dozen times. And suddenly, something different happened. Suddenly the judge, from, from his like mean, ferocious, tyrannical uh, character, all of a sudden he becomes like grandpa at the fireplace at Christmas time with his favorite granddaughter on his knee. And he says, Zoila, no it wasn't Isabel Zoila, it was Zoila, yeah. That's the correct name. Zoila. He says, Zoila. He says, here in Chicago, we have these incredible skyscrapers. And at the top of these skyscrapers are the finest attorneys in the world. So, Zoila, if you would just pick one, any one, the most expensive one you could find. <laughs> Here's my business card. Call me. And and when you pick the attorney, just call me and, and I will call that attorney and explain to him that it's his turn to do pro bono work for you, Zoila. And that means that means that you will not have to pay anything. And you'll have the best attorney in the world. And you know, so she takes the business card, and we went to lunch. <laughs> and, and, and later, uh, she prevailed. Because there are some attorneys that are like $10,000 an hour. And they, they don't, they, they're not in the business for losing. You know, they couldn't stand it on their record. <laughs> So, um, let's see, so we, six minutes, six minutes, um, Thing is immunity for a criminal act. And 
And I was just overwhelmed at that particular time, you know, because I was up against a whole battery of attorneys and uh, the judge was already ruling in their favor, which uh, never should have happened. And I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't have my ducks in a row at the time to, to really fight on that. And it still exists as a possibility. Um, I also had some experiences too, like I had mentioned the thing with the State Department. I beat the State Department and people asked me, well, did you sue them? And yes, they did. Some interesting things happened. The guy from the State Department that swore out the criminal complaint against me, they transferred him to Vienna, Austria. Gone, like that. The prosecutor, the female prosecutor that Mike Wilson trained, she disappeared, gone for years. And, uh, and as far as me suing them, I was rearrested and they put me through such a savage beating that they broke my back. Uh, one of the guys that had beaten me up the first time at the Dallas County Jail, he came and stood over me I'm on the floor with a broken back. And this guy comes and stands over me and says, so Mr. Fox, are you gonna appeal now? You know, they do that kind of stuff, but uh, I don't give up. And so, you know, I'm still uh, working on suing these jerks. Since we only have three minutes, I only have uh, 16 questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I waited patiently now, okay? Uh, I got that kind of slot. <laughs> right. So do we um, go to this today, or whichever one you want you choose to answer. Uh, we went over the mental evaluation, um, but there was no comment to whether or not you can have your mental evaluation before you go to court, and there's like a statute of limitations, in other words, you get a mental evaluation in the last three months or six months, then you get to pull a new one. Is there such a term? Um, well, I think that if it was a long time, you know, they might be able to raise that as an issue, but you know, if you know that something may come down. Yes or no, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when they do that to you in court, <laughs> the answer is a sworn oath to tell the whole truth. And if yes or no does not cover it, then I need an exemption or an immunity from perjury. Nor am I an adversarial witness. Therefore, they can't pull that either. Anyhow, uh, next one. Uh, can you comment on why um, the issue, the attorneys don't have a license? Why would they have a license? I'm asking, can you comment on that? Elaborate a little bit. Okay. Because they're running their racket, okay? And they're not, they're not about to set themselves up to have to have, uh, to pay any of us, like the riffraff, you know, they consider us down here, and they're an exalted status as an attorney. So basically, what you they know, have is a, is a bar card. They all they got is the bar card. The bar card. I, I mean, if you if you get stopped on the on the freeway by a state trooper, and he says, "Let me see your driver's license," and you give him your American Automobile Association membership, what's he going to say? This is not a license, and this is not good enough. They have a bar card. All that is is a professional association, and it's not a license. And if you get into a discussion with them, the question is, what state officer accepts the annual renewal fee, and how much is it, and do you have a receipt? Right. They paid nothing. They paid for the bar, but the bar isn't the state. So where, who's issuing this license? It's not another business bureau. Huh? It's not under the business bureau. Right. Right. Once we pull his rocks out, fire. No, my friend. Okay. Um,
Can we get a copy of the uh, document for entry into the case? Okay. Uh, you mentioned Mr. Lattery, uh, John Lattery. Is that case published? Really? No. No. Not that I know of. You wouldn't be able to have access to it, or is there any way that you uh, know? It was in a suburb of, of Chicago. Uh, I think it started with a W, but I can't recall exactly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. That sounds more like it. I'm not sure though. Was it up north towards the uh, right off the lake? I don't recall. Okay. Well, if we do, uh, maybe we will talk about it by tomorrow. Um, going back to the mental evaluation, this thought was an afterthought. So, uh, why do you uh, believe that the fifth, <clears throat> raising the fifth, the mental evaluation? might be able to stop them on the spot. Because you cannot be compelled to be a witness against yourself. It's like the Miranda warning. Okay? You have a right to remain silent. Okay. okay. So wouldn't that imply that uh, even upon um, the proposition of undergoing such a mental evaluation, you can at that time decline or not volunteer? Right. Right. But they force it upon you. See, okay, the difference between the two things, if you've got a, a mental evaluation that you could whip out in court and say, I've already got my mental evaluation, that's something dead in their tracks. Okay, which means that you're going to go home to lunch with your wife. Sure, it's understood. Okay. I'm talking about but, if you, they pull you off the road and then you end up in this, you get steamrolled and you don't have time to do this. I mean, none of us here expect to have a mental evaluation, right? I'm not just going to go carry one in my pocket next couple okay. of years, just in case. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Just All right. I understand what you're, what you're, what you're saying. Right. Now, if you do get caught, like, they're not going to send you to a mental evaluation or a parking ticket, leastwise not that I've ever seen. Well, you want to but you get, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but if you get into a, into a ruckus with a federal judge about tax evasion, you'll be, you'll be in a mental evaluation in a flash. Well, Times are tough right now. Nobody makes a buck. Anyway, but you know what I'm saying. Even if you, even if you use this strategy, yes, it'll save you from the mental evaluation and radically shorten your time. But you could still be there for a month. Right. You know what I'm saying. Right. Because the U.S. Marshals are kind of slow about getting you moved. A wonderful IQ. What can you expect? Uh, <laughs> facts put into evidence by testimony. It is my understanding that evidence is a, um, uh, in order to be admissible, would have to have relevance. Right. Okay. So, uh, to your statement where you say uh, you have to have facts put into evidence by testimony, can we add relevant evidence? Because they'll say a bunch of crap. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's yeah, take yeah. case. They're going to have 15 IRS witnesses. And they'll state to facts. And what I'm noticing is that they state to facts of what they did, but they ne neither one of them can state to the truthfulness of the numbers in the documents they reference. They come from some computer, somebody else entered it. They, they, from this office, that on, office. On those tax cases, they'll never have the paperwork done right. They'll never have a lawful assessment. These are several points that they have to meet in order to have it be a lawful assessment. But they'll come into court and they'll say, well, we had this computation and we've got such and such records. Well, U.S. versus Smith, you can refuse to allow them to bring in business records. Most people don't know that. The judge does allow that, though. Well, this is a case that says, no, they're not allowed. Right. And now, if you run into that situation, it's just like Don McCarley. He, he was denied assistance of counsel when the United States Supreme Court said, you can't do that. And yes, he was denied assistance of counsel. 
So he walks out the front door of the courthouse. Okay. You know, see, it sets up a heads we win, tails they lose situation. You've got it, what they have to do, what's right to do, what's lawful, and then when they break the law, well, they lose the case. So if they did what they're supposed to, they lose the case. And if they do what they're not supposed to, they lose the case. It's our experience that in, the, in tax cases, uh, what they do, um, the judge will allow the jury to see an inadmissible evidence. And in, in the end, he'll advise the jury that um, this is the law, and the law says these guys have to pay, and uh, you signed an agreement that you're going to take the law as I give it to you. And uh, they, I'm telling you that the law says they have to pay. And that's about it. And he's the dictator of that stage in the game. And the jury convicts. And they don't, don't seem to care that that's the issue because now the world knows these guys are in jail. And six months later, they win on appeal, but nobody knows that on reversible errors. Like you're suggesting, I'm assuming you're, you're keeping out their evidence or you're triggering the mechanism reversible errors. Am I correct? Right. Very well. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the DWI case. Um, I know um, why your clients got off. Would you like me to tell you? There were no celebrities. That's a good one. That's a good one. Say that again. There were no celebrities. Obviously, they, they need a celebrity to make a case care of the rest of us, right? So, there's your answer. Uh, okay, joking aside. Um, you mentioned going to the grand jury. Uh, that We find that that's not an easy task, and uh, they'll block you. And if you try to go to the grand jury when you're in, in a particular case, uh, they'll, they'll attack you as tampering the jury. Do you... Have you tried that many times? Do you do you know of a path that's easier because the prosecution will disallow it and they'll jump all over you? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, that's what I was planning on discussing tomorrow Good. when we go that's from the issue of indictment, arraignment, uh, pre-trial, uh, trial, and and uh, sentencing. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> then you, you went on to do affidavits, uh, but in every case you've only re referenced affidavits filed in the state courts. Uh, would it be the same thing with a federal, or what would you file with a federal affidavit in the particular court you're in? Or? Okay, when I was talking about Dr. Barry Brooks, that was federal. Oh, it was federal. Yeah, and, uh, um, and I got another one here uh, that I could uh, share with you about a guy by the name of Jeff Skiba. Sure. Oh, will all, all those documents be available for everybody who copies, if we make copies? Uh, or well, we're going to have to send out to get them, some of them made tomorrow, <coughs> maybe. Or, or, uh, or I can, uh, I've got, I've got a bunch of this stuff on an e-disc, but we didn't have a, a, a duplicator here. I've got a back in Texas, you know, one in and seven out, and uh, uh, but I, I was like swamped and I didn't have a chance to create the, uh, the disc. Okay. So, um, um, can we make that available with the DVDs? If, if, yeah, if one gonna, of us offers to make a copy, just throw that. I was gonna, I was gonna send that with the DVDs. <coughs> right. The, uh, um, what was it again? What were you asking? What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Not important. They so got it. It's on the table. By the table. Okay. Those affidavits in the court. Yes. In federal court. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, in the Skiba case, uh, I filed one document. The case was finished. And uh, the affidavit. That was. Huh? The affidavit. You filed the affidavit. We're talking about affidavit. Yeah. Federal yeah. Court. I've got a copy of it right here. Right. Here. Um, in an IRS situation, this affidavit, can you kind of sketch what, what would go in there in that affidavit in an IRS case? What, what, are you going to address that tomorrow? Do you have a case with IRS that such an affidavit was filed into a court and had this effect, or is not the case? Does not apply, or can you elaborate on that? 
Well, these cases may have some things different, but then there's some areas of commonality as well. Um, like Tim and Dawn's case, that's a tax case. Um, but it's not like every tax case. Uh, they, uh, you know, that's where they denied me as being a witness. Understood, that Judge. Denied. That's why I'm uh, looking at the affidavit because the affidavit in a tax case would be pretty much the same issue, cookie cutter, I would assume. Facts are different, there's circumstances. But whether there's a liability, duty, et cetera, et cetera, okay. that's the affidavit would more or less be in the same way. Um, on that, you know, uh, I have a little bit different approach than a lot of people. Great. I, you know, I put together a page of questions for Tim, mm -hmm. and, you know, he didn't ask the IRS agent this stuff because it's too ferocious. You gotta be ferocious. Those guys are monsters. And, uh, um, I'm debating in my own mind whether we should even have that on, on recorded because I, uh, I'd rather almost that we just turn the recorders, all of them off, and I explain to you how to win those deals. Show of hands, everybody okay with that? Yeah, fine. We're cool. Good. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll reserve how much do you need? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half hour? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, on what basis did you fire the attorneys uh, in the Isabella's case, or Isabella's, whatever? Oh, that was uh, Zuela. Zuela. Isabella Suarez was the one who was denied her medication. I just had it crossed in my mind. Uh, she was denied her medication at that federal facility, and the, the paramedics came and they wouldn't let them in, and she died. And, all that stuff, but the one in Chicago Zoyla. was Zoila. That's the one I thought about. What was the basis for you firing the attorneys in her case? Incompetence. She didn't do it. He didn't do it. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't look at her evidence. He didn't subpoena her witnesses. Okay, so those are technical. That's what I was asking. Particulars. Uh, so this number one, number two, number three. So there were several elements that he didn't do his job. And, you know, once you discover that they have no ability or, or they're not going to exercise any due diligence for your case, right? you know, I mean, what do you need them for? Yeah, well, the reason I'm asking is because we have a similar case in Northern California. And there was a list of 139 questions asked, and they couldn't answer these questions. And the uh, federal judge specifically said, well, um, Look, uh, we have these uh, public attorneys here, and they're very competent. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. if you can't find, and they like recommended Larry B. Kraft, the, the court recommended Larry B. Kraft as a, as a tax attorney, and we found that quite intriguing. Uh, but uh, I'm sure all the other people that are in prison would also find that intriguing. <laughs> 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 Yeah, well, well that's what loves the paper. Yeah, j just for for, uh, for a quick comment, if I may, please. Um, it, it really serves nobody for us to bash each other or to, to speak negatively of each other. I think the time is for all of us to kind of pull it together. And if we show a little bit more understanding of the attorneys, maybe they'll try to understand a little bit more what we're for. That's like training <laughs> scorpions, right? Uh, well, you guys have trained scorpions. <laughs> I think we need to harmonize. Uh, I, I so happen to know uh, they do have uh, uh, they, they have good intentions, and whether they're misguided by previous education or not it may not make a difference. Okay. All right. Um, Deep down, they're really good. That's why they bury them 12 feet instead of 6 <laughs> There was, there was another question, but it was not going to be placed by me. I have a young man who wants to say. All right, Jess. Thank you. On a couple of those cases you talked about allocution, when those people walked out uh, at their allocution, did the felony stand against them? And if so, is there a way to get rid of that? Hmm. That's a good question, and I am not sure.
sure. Yes, I think it probably dropped off, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, you know, one of them, I coached the guy uh, over the phone, for instance, uh, Reverend Austin Miles in California. Apparently a lot of people know him. And, uh, you know, he called me. He'd already been convicted. And his sentencing was coming up. And uh, I coached him. He walked up the front door. As to whatever happened uh, after that, I'm not sure. And uh, I did get a letter from him, you know, declaring that, uh, you know, that I coached him and helped him understand this thing. And, that he was able to walk out the front door. Uh, Don Carly walked out the front door as well. Now I was involved in Don's thing from close to the beginning, but a lot of times the people will call me and they're already through a whole bunch of it, like Austin Miles was. So already convicted before he made contact with And I've had a lot of, you know, a lot of cases where I'm only involved in, in a piece of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I can't remember all of this stuff that I've been involved in, but some of the, some of the things are pretty amazing, like they were with Zoila, I'll never forget that one, you know, and, uh, there's another one, uh, I mentioned Jeff Skiba. Uh, how are we doing time-wise? What are we doing? Well, we're, we're we started a new tape, so. You're uh, uh, over time. 20 after, so if you want to take a few more questions, um, you can, or you can, whatever. If you're hungry, we'll bring you a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Water. Uh, about 10 minutes and be 5.30. Switch up. Um, I read a lot on the attorney's notice of appearance, and you mentioned the attorneys do have to make an entrance into the case. What exactly is the notice of appearance? Is it does it represent some kind of a trust, an insurance policy, um, some kind of bond? Do you know? Good question. I, I don't know. The I know. I just think there's more to it. Someone actually a few years ago did say it gave me a huge explanation that at the time I didn't understand. But I just want to get to the bottom of what exactly the notice of appearance actually is, because I think there's a lot more to it than just an attorney saying, "Hey, I'm here." You may very well be right, and you know I just don't know the answer to that. Does anybody know or know anybody that I can talk to that would know? I have heard that. case dealing with that recently and I was asking the attorney themselves because I was interviewing attorneys for competence um, and I asked them that if they knew what the difference was between representative counsel and the assistance of counsel because I was not interested in representative counsel I was not interested in becoming a ward of the court and I was not interested in, in retaining their services I was interested in possibly hiring them to assist me that they knew the procedure and this was something that I had learned from somebody so I was just questioning him asking that so I don't know if the notice of appearance is a notice of representation uh, and letting them know that you are waiving certain rights, the right to speak, the right to talk to the judge. I don't know. That's just my, well, my idea of it is, I so know. I don't know that helps. A few years ago, it seems like they said something about that it goes into, it has to do with the trust and their, their, bond, their bonding and, and all of that, but it's, there was like, it was a big deal. And it's not something that you're just going to read in the rules of procedure or something. Anyway, I just thought maybe somebody I know. Yeah, I wish I knew everything, but I don't. Okay. And then you had mentioned earlier five types of affidavits. If you could talk about that. Five tomorrow. types of affidavits? Yeah. Five elements. Five elements. Five elements. Oh, it's five elements. Okay. Yeah, we need to know that. That's the same thing. You gave four. And then in the beginning, and I missed this, you mentioned Rule 12. Um, yeah. Was the federal Texas? Texas. I mean, it was Texas Rule 12, and that's just, you challenged the attorney. What Texas Rule 12 says? 
Is it rules of is. civil procedure? Or civil, yes. Okay, that's all. That's what I wanted. Okay. Thanks. But it, it's civil procedure, but uh, you you can use it anywhere because uh, um, the concept agency is what you is is over everything. I meant to mention this report with agency. If anybody's studying it, you might also want to research public policy because that's where the um, they're going to get you. During Sue's case, we discovered that if an attorney does not enter himself into the case properly, he has no right to speak at any time during the proceedings, period. And if you discover in your case and you search your records, that attorney has not entered properly into your case and gave notice to the court that he has entered into the case, he has no standing in that court whatsoever. He cannot speak in that court. He don't belong in it out the door. He's trespassing. And everything he enters into the case is, is out the door. Stricken. Has to be stricken. So is that a document that he might have to enter into the case? Notice of appearance. It's not, it'll be right there on the United States versus you, and it'll be right on there. And he, his bar license number and everything will be there. And if you go back into the docket, there will be a, a place in the docket where he entered the case. Notice if it ain't the there, he notices the court that he's in the case as an attorney. And if he ain't there, he's not properly licensed, his bar license ain't there, he can't belong there. The federal court, they all in her case, speak the devil. They all in her case said, oh, excuse me, I'm working under my boss's license. Well, guess who her boss's attorneys were? The guy who just got filed criminal charges against him got fired. Mr. Fast and furious. Dennis Burke. But under the Fast and Furious scam. The Fast and Furious scam. He's the one who stole $100,000 bail money from me that I bailed her out of jail with, and we're going to file charges against Dennis Burke and the court that he used that hundred thousand dollars to give to those drug lords down there to shoot that cop. Buy guns. Yeah, he used that money to buy guns, but then he stole from me. This is they got to prove otherwise. This is off the tape, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the editing. Don't worry, it's, it's only the editing. <laughs> You talk to the editor right here. <laughs> now we get a charge. Huh? This is how we make the book. Talking about the attorneys having to file an appearance, I did have a case in which the attorneys did not. I did file a motion in the court stating as such. And obviously, not knowing exactly how things should be done, we're finding ourselves in a situation that even if you do do it right or if you do, don't do it right, they still want to move forward. And I think that's one of the things I'm really hoping to find here is trying to get enforcement, trying to get some power, trying to get some authority. And that's why I really think that the um, the agency is a very important part. Again, trying to get follow through, I think, is one of the problems I'm experiencing. And it sounds like some others are maybe here too. What was your question? I said, more common to was our question. Oh, okay. Yeah, case I'm involved in. There's an attorney who says that she is the bank's attorney, and it, her name shows on the documentation where she files. But I went into the records and went pulled all the records, got certified copies, and nowhere in there could I find anything that said she represented the bank, that the bank gave her authority to represent him. So. Is she the attorney of record, or is she just BS yes Well, I can't tell from here whether she's the attorney or, or just BSing you. However, I think you'll be surprised to know, and am I getting sorry, but to run this by you, um, when the attorney says she represents the bank, and you make the challenge, 
she comes back and she says, well, I got a letter here from the bank. Excuse me, any high school kid can create a letter from the bank. Get the picture? What you can do with computers these days is astounding, okay? First so, so, yeah, Obama's first student, thank you. So, so anyway, the, the attorney says, well, I got this letter here from the bank. That's worthless, that's not evidence. So then the attorney says, well, uh, I got this, uh, this check and, and I got this affidavit. Well, all affidavits, if you're in court, okay? And it's the showdown time as to where's the evidence, okay? And she says, well, I got this affidavit here. Well, all affidavits are hearsay until they're testified to. So it doesn't matter who signed the affidavit. If they're not in the courtroom to testify to it, it's hearsay. Next, what do you have? And so then, uh, if the if by chance she says, "Well, uh, I got somebody here from the bank," okay. Well, if it turns out to be that they dressed up the janitor to put out in the witness stand, that's not going to work if you ask the right questions. Now, supposing it's somebody serious, a vice president or a CEO or something like this, and they get on the witness stand. First thing they have to do is prove who they are. <coughs> then they have to, this is, this is one of the beauties, because I, I, I was, I took training from over 50 top trainers, and John Nelson was amongst them. John Nelson is off the scale. Comparing others with John Nelson is like comparing Cessnas with the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> and um, I was tutored by John Nelson. And so anyway, when they uh, uh, raised this, that, that they uh, have the authority from the bank, etc because they got this guy in the witness stand. There's a case that John Nelson turned me on to, and it's called Osborne versus U.S. Bank. And this is an 1824 case. It's approximately 100 pages long. And what it, it has a lot of stuff in it. For instance, all attorneys know that corporations must be represented by an attorney. But if you ask them where they came from, they don't know. Well, that's the case where it comes from. The case has been cited thousands of times and never overturned. And it's, like I say, it's from 1824. Now, what that case says is it addresses the issue and says that their whole authority derives from the charter. And the charter is the law for the corporation, which is the bank. And if they're going to show up in court, they have to have the law in their hand. So if they don't have the corporate charter in their hand, they don't got, they got nothing. And furthermore, the, the CEO who's on the witness stand has to not only have the corporate charter, but he also has to have the minutes of the meeting where he was delegated the authority to hire the attorney. And without all of that, he can't point to the attorney and say, and that's the attorney I hired with full authority. Now, you can see the kind of complications they have because they come in, they're arrogant, they're lazy and they're stupid. So when they come in, they don't come in prepared. And it's like the attorney in Dallas about the house and the and, uh, Bankers Trust of California. And I want to look at this, and there's nobody in this courtroom from Bankers Trust of California to verify what this guy is saying. And he lost the case right there. It took 10 days to get the certified win in hand. But that's what it was. That's huge. That is huge. 
What's the other Osborne versus who? U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank? Bank. U.S. Bank or, or Bank of the United States, I forget which. How long? 1824. Well, it appears I'm wearing out some people's ears. No, those, those are the considerate people. We want to stay. <laughs> Look, you'd have to talk to Ron and, and Susie about staying the night here. In this <laughs> room. Everything, everything is negotiable. Right? <laughs> 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 I want to hear about the IRS and you turn the reporters off and do that. Well, those other people left. Tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow. 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 How about tomorrow? I think we have a lot of people that have flown in and they're yeah. tired and uh, yeah. they get some rest. We bring them and they're tired of the Are you staying tonight? Because then we can do the first thing tomorrow morning if you're staying tonight. If you're planning oh, on leaving. I, I, he no, just lives down the street. You got no excuse then. All right, I guess we'll see everybody tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Great. All right.